Hello, uh, welcome to Talking Pictures. I'm Mary Stack. I'm Michael Dow. And we're going to um, trundle through the latest rare gems that we found in the cinematographic realm. And um, we're going to talk about three films today. Mm -hmm. Beautiful Boy, Bohemian Rhapsody, and Can You Ever Forgive Me? Very different movies. There was one of the good things that happened after the elections. Mm -hmm. Some good movies came out to watch. Yeah. Distract us. Uh, so we're in this kind of season of um, theme films, mm -hmm. and I noticed there was like three particular films we were talking about this, Michael, right? There's these rock star kind of... These, yeah, mythopoeic rock star movies. Right. Yeah. Um, and we're going to talk about Rap Bohemian Rhapsody, which is Freddie Mercury. Mm -hmm. And then we've got these kind of quirky twists on classics like The Nutcracker, and they brought out on that dreadful collusion of like Alice in Wonderland and C.S. Lewis. These mishmash films, really. Which is The Nutcracker and The Four Realms. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know what that's all about. And then the whole, a whole array of films about kids in families caught in kind of quagmires. And yeah. Addiction and... Which smells like award season. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, uh, but some of those are, are kind of interesting, yeah, and you, you, know, you call that a social... Yeah, well, there, I mean, I think oftentimes when it's time to get serious with films and grab the Academy's attention, we usually get into, you know, social issue movies. And it seems as if, like, this season is really like a hotbed of them. Mm. I mean, specifically with films like Boy Erased, right. which is all about, you know, familial conflict based around a boy who is insistent upon coming out of the closet versus the religious upbringing. Right. Uh, there's also Ben is back, right? Mm -hmm. And there's also mm -hmm. Beautiful Boy, a couple mm -hmm. of films that deal very mm -hmm. much with, what, adolescent addiction? Right. Crisis and trying to deal with that within a family structure. Yeah, I mean, I, I am kind of a sucker for those movies because I love the old, like, Lillian Gish social issue films from the silent era, you know? It's like, I love that kind of melodrama. So hopefully they'll deal with those themes with a certain amount of taste and, and restraint. Mm. Here's to hoping, anyway. Well, Beautiful Boy, let's start with that one. Uh, this was, uh, had all the ingredients of a great film. Mm -hmm. um, addiction, father-son relationship. Uh, Felix Van Groningen directed and co-wrote the script, and he'd been nominated for a foreign film Oscar previously. Um, so that was potentially quite interesting. Mm. Um, and then he teamed up with Luke Davis, who wrote the screenplay for Lion. So here we have two very seasoned professionals, but uh, unfortunately, I think the corporate interests must have gotten in the way of this working because this entire film is marred by the most invasive, annoying soundtrack. Mm. This mishmash soundtrack, which constantly intrudes into the dialogue, which actually is pretty amazing, the dialogue here. So what they did was they took two separate memoirs, a father's view of this crisis that he's dealing with, with his son who's addicted to crystal meth. And then the son also wrote a separate memoir Mm -hmm. and they merged them into this script. So the narrative is somewhat odd because you oscillate between perspectives in the, in the film. Do you actually get into like subjective perspectives as if it's like dueling narratives? Well, yes, because there's kind of jumps in the film where the father's on this, we're gonna take care of this, I'm gonna research this, and then he jumps and the kid is laying in a car and you see his life, mm -hmm. his existence, his hanging out in the coffee shop waiting for the next person to come and give him some Deal, fix. do a deal. Yeah. So anyway, so the, the people in it are Steve Carell, who does a great job as this South, uh, San Francisco journalist who's very preppy and cool. And the son, who is a kid called Timothy uh, Chalamet, yeah. who's... A hot property. Very good. Mm -hmm. Very good. Playing this tortured, um, almost kind of Jekyll and Hyde character. Mm -hmm. So at times he's this loving enthusiastic, perfect, beautiful boy that the father remembers. And then he kind of oscillates from that into this awful, sinister, dark character who's cruel and it gets increasingly more extreme in the things okay. he's wanting to do because he has to, you know, surf the fix. Right. So um, it's, it's a, a bit long. It's torturous, that path, because, you know, there are times when it, things look like they're on the up and up, as yeah. with all addictions. 
And then there's um, the relapse. And then there's the relapse. Mm -hmm. So he goes through relapse, recovery. It's all going to be different, Dad. I'm mm -hmm. fine. I'm fine. Is it something like a, um, almost like a procedural movie? Because oftentimes I think of some of my favorite drug movies. It's a weird thing. Like films like dr al drug allegory movies. I don't know if you ever saw uh, Drugstore Cowboy. It's probably my favorite film about addiction mm. and taking you through the process of why these characters do what they do, both, you know, the virtues of sobriety, but, you know, just as significantly, the reasoning, the motivation, the justification as to why they do persistently relapse. Is it a, is it a film that kind of gets into that? Not really. Not really. No, because um, the kid's view, of course, is I'm doing fine, I'm doing fine. He seems socially uneasy, this mm -hmm. kid. Um, and then he'll go to a dinner party and he'll go into the bathroom and lo and behold, he goes in the drugs cabinet and off he goes again. Right. After weeks or months of being clean, mm -hmm. he's, and he's, it's all about how, how you lie as mm -hmm. an addict. It reminded me of the man, you know the man with the golden, you were talking about classics, the yeah. man with the golden arm? Right, sure. That, that was one of the best descents yeah. into that whole area. Right. And I felt we could have gone further in this film with the d kind of descent, mm -hmm. psychological unraveling, mm. and it, we never got to that because of the bloody soundtrack. And also Constantly. this, uh, well, I think also maybe this kind of sharing of the narratives, is that something as well? Yeah, it like, is difficult. Yeah. yeah. Because he's trying to build a second family, Steve Carell. Mm -hmm. um, he's got another wife and two other small kids, and that's starting to be fractured and challenged yeah. by these disappearances. Okay. The kid's disappearing, he reappears, you know, with that, that stress. So it's, it's worth seeing. Prodigal um, son kind of thing. Yeah, prodigal son, yeah. And in fact, they sell you at the end that this kid's been eight years clean and he's doing very well. So yeah. there's an up, upbeat ending. But as I say, two great performances marred by a very mm, annoying soundtrack. Yeah, that's good to mention it. And I don't know if this exactly qualifies, but maybe the next time we see a movie like this where, that I've seen, just to kind of, just kind of talk about the reasoning behind, because I don't quite understand it, the way in which films just seem to want to kind of like pile on with seemingly random songs that everybody knows or has a familiarity with, but there's no like associative justification as to why why this song, why yeah. at this point, why it seems as if they're just kind of filling gaps. Yeah, it or they're scared of the silence. Yeah. You know, which I think in, in, yeah. in these kind of films you need the silence. You need rumination. The awkwardness. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. need to have your under your audience take that time or provide them the time to contemplate the circumstances of a character. Mm. You know, rather than kind of pave over it with a song that doesn't seem to apply. Mm. It's strange. I mean, and there have been a number of films that have done that lately. It seems to be the really? trend. Yeah. I mean, I kind of like, I'm a, I'm a person that actually likes soundtracks. Mm -hmm. I think when they're done well, I'm thinking of Into the Wild. Yeah, but my mind instantly fabulous. goes, it's like, okay, what was the choice? I mean, why did they make this choice? How does the song in some subtle or metaphoric way, how does it relate to the mm. moment in the film, the you know the plot point. If it, is it a transitional song? How does this film? How does the song mark the transition in the narrative? You know, I'm always asking questions, and when I don't, I can't come up with those easy answers in the moment. I get frustrated. You know. Yeah, good. It, it's a good thought. It's yeah. a good thought. I mean, um, I'm not against music in films. Trust yeah. me, I love them. Soundtracks. Can I'm, I tend to sit there and I think, okay, how much did it cost to use that Nirvana song? You know, that's what <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking. Yeah, well, you know, that's they had a lot of it. money in yeah. this film. But as you John say, Lennon it's like it's, it's easy to kind of get knocked out of the film and then you start kind of thinking in a distracted way rather than remaining absorbed mm, in yeah, the moment. Yeah, it definitely was a distraction. Okay, so speaking of distractions on the rock star saga mm -hmm. stories. Yeah. <laughs> we have a very different views on this film. Um, I think Michael felt a lot more strongly about Bohemian Rhapsody. Yeah, right? let's try to keep this conversational because otherwise I'll yeah. go on one of my rants and bore everybody. So Brian Singer um, is the director of this. Ostensibly. Uh, yeah, apparently Queen had a lot to do with it, the, the remaining members of the band. And uh, I think everybody's put their sixpence mm. worth in and that's why it ended up being like a bit of a sort of a ratatouille. A bit of a whitewash, yeah. yeah. I mean, well, I mean, again, th there are a couple of like telltale harbingers, you know, before you go into the movie. Number one, that, you know, it is an authorized film. It, it kind of presents itself as a film about Freddie Mercury when it's really much more about the band. It is and the film bends over backwards to give each member of the band equal credit. So it wants to have its cake and eat it too. It wants to present Freddie Mercury as this kind of mercurial figure, you know, who's at the center of the universe of the phenomenon of Queen, while at the same time, the film gives over, I think, entirely too much to the voices of the band members. Not to, not to discredit them in any way, but it does very much feel like an authorized film. 
where everyone need to have, needed to have some kind of diplomatic say. You know. So let's, for, for people that don't know anything about Queen, mm. uh, that might be watching. Uh, so Rami Malek plays uh, Freddie Mercury, um, and he really does inhabit the body and style of Freddie Mercury, um, apart from the false teeth, which I thought were way over the top. Mm. I mean, and entirely too much attention is paid way, to that as well. Way, way too right? much. Um, and he struts around the streets of London, and he's a Parsi immigrant. Uh, they don't talk much about his background at all, which is, is a, a great loss. To oh, they do, less, they do less than that, but maybe yeah. that's something um, to get to. Anyway, he, he struts around. You don't know anything about what he does for a living or anything. And suddenly, he, through a series of circumstances, uh, ends up trying out for this band. Um, and... That you do get some kind of sense of the development of their dynamic, a little bit, the musical dynamic, but not nearly enough. Mm -hmm. um, so they somehow, through the fact that he says they're a family because they're all kind of oddballs, they are kind of quirky and nerdy. I mean, they're neuroscientists yeah. and astrophysicists. Yeah, well, they, it's a little bit kind of like the reputation of The Who, where it's like you get the sense of they're a band, but they're four very individualized members, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. who just mm -hmm. somehow managed to fit. The chemistry is just quirky, but it, it fits and it works, even though there's constant conflict within the band, yeah. Correct. As with any band, of course, but... Uh, so anyway, we, we get some sense of the behind-the-scenes thing, the record executives, the struggling financially, and then the explosion to fame. And, you know, Freddie's particular genius isn't really explored. Where did all this musical inspiration and training come from? They don't tell us about anything about the fact he studied opera. We find this incredible range in terms of his vocal abilities. Mm -hmm. um, and also, he has a relationship with a woman, um, and then he, of course, by the 70s, is full into the kind of wild party scene where he starts to explore his more homosexual aspects. Um, and that's kind of like seen as a big kind of second chapter, which then has him turning into an addict, and then he has AIDS, and f picks up the odd gentleman along the way and ends up with a, a, a very nice man who mm. has a wonderful relationship with who we again know nothing about. Yeah. Um, and Jim Hutton, and, and that's it's yeah. an entire, whatever, third act of his life that the film, I'm going to jump around a little bit and spoiler alert, whatever, but it's, um, it's interesting because the film's big denouement, and it's in the advertising, is the Live Aid concert, which justifiably right. so is like the sing one of the single greatest live moments of any band, whatever. But then after that, you get the coda, and he spent the last seven years of his life with his partner. You know, it's like it completely yes. skirts yeah. Yeah. that yeah. whole third act of his life. Well, I think, I think you, you, for me, they did a wonderful razzmatazz, superficial, the costumes are fantastic. The actual image of Freddie Mercury walking onto the stage at Wembley mm -hmm. is so incredible, and his voice is so remarkable. It's, it's too bad. Language. You can't believe it isn't Freddie Mercury. It yeah. really is pretty it, amazing. Somebody, uh, just a little tiny aside, it's like there, there are several master shots that are just CGI produced that are just hideous. Oh, well, the, They're yeah, horrible, yeah. and it just undermines the reality of that moment for him. You know? But the, the visual perfection of mimicking everything of that entry onto the stage yeah. from behind, right. you said this, but isn't, is but, remarkable. Right. However, that's where it ends. <laughs> we don't know anything yeah. about but Freddie Mercury. But isn't that at the same time the problem with the film? It's, it's entirely too heavily steeped in this mimesis. It, it replicates through a kind of window dressing process all these like highlights of his, of his career and his rise to fame and you know the kind of apotheosis of Live Aid. But it's just that. It's window dressing. There's no inner life with this character. There's no attempt whatsoever in the film to delve into, okay, here's Freddie Mercury as the, you know, wannabe rock star. What's motivating? What's driving him? The film just seems to suggest that he's born with genius and it's just the band's responsibility mm. to discover it and nurture it. You know, and then later in the film, what really troubles me, and again, I, I, you know, there is this strange homophobic undercurrent to the film. If you want to talk about it, mm. we, can, we don't yeah, have no, to go no, there. No, I mean, it's, it's a valid point. You yeah, saw it but from a like, different perspective. Yeah, so you see it, you see it with this, this woman he's involved with, and the woman is, again, very shallowly portrayed as his muse, mm. okay? Mm. And, you know, they, they spend one romantic evening together, and he wakes up in the morning and just mysteriously composes Bohemian Rhapsody as if it came to him. There's no... There's no real emphasis placed on what made him who he was, right? Whether it's his upbringing, whether it's his sexuality. There's no emphasis on an interrogation of what made him a so-called genius, mm. okay? Mm. The film 
doesn't spend any time whatsoever on the labor, the hard work, the, the intensity, the conflict involved in producing the works of art that Queen produced over and over again. You know, and, th and this is telltale. I mean, the film basically l it limits its soundtrack to, what, half a dozen of all the Queen songs mm, everybody mm, knows. Mm. It doesn't get any deeper into the catalog. It doesn't take any chances in terms of, you know, exposing the mass audience to things that, you know, are m maybe more subtle about Queen's reputation or their image. For example, that, not to inter interrupt yeah. you, but I have one of the recordings that Freddie Mercury did, Barcelona, yeah. which is all operatic with yeah. a full-blown diva. And... That was when he was working on his own, when he t takes time off from the band. We never right. learned anything about what he did during that period. It's a massively yeah. elliptical movie. And not only that, but it also condenses and it alters and it distorts the historical timeline. Okay, it's, I mean, I'll give you so many examples. But, you know, one of the ones that I, th I thought was really telling, and there's a montage in the movie, a very convenient one where the film can condense a very significant a transitional point in Freddie Mercury's life, it is that period when he enters into the homosexual when he comes subculture. Out. Yeah. First of all, if I can back up very briefly, <coughs> there's a character in the film, John Reed. Uh, he is the one kind of overtly homosexual character who Freddie Mercury encounters earlier on mm. in the kind of development of his career. The guy attempts to seduce Freddie Mercury, Freddie Mercury rebuffs his advances. The guy doesn't take no for an answer. He threw a kind of fiat, he takes over as manager of Queen mm, in the late 70s, mm, mm. seduces Freddie Mercury into the gay underworld, and then what do we get? We get this brief montage with Another One Bites the Dust, which I find very tasteless, using that song as an implied kind of reference point for the audience to say, ah, okay, this is where he gets AIDS, you know, in the early 80s. Combined with the fact... Whoa, yeah, no, no, combined... So you, you saw things no, I don't John, know that anybody problems, saw besides this you. This is the problem. The film is very quasi-Christian <coughs> in its allegory. You know, and then, you know, and then... And, and it, never mind the fact the film reductively farms out <coughs> the role of the bad guy to one character. If you remember in A Star is Born, what was our biggest complaint? It was mm. that the manager's the, the bad manager. guy. It's not the two lead characters. They're, you know, mm. ultimately mm. virtuous. So there's that. There's the serpent in the garden. There's the whole kind of process. There's the come to Jesus redemption Freddie Mercury has where he returns to the band, confesses his sins, and, you know, the All it's, one like, the, it's like the apostles <laughs> take him back into the fold. It's so reductive. Well, it's, yes, it is. It's, it is. you know, to but, the point of absurdity. But. Never mind. Can I just say, too, as an aside, <laughs> another one bites the dust isn't even the best choice. Couldn't they have? <laughs> done like crazy little thing called love mm. which is a song that doesn't mm. even appear in the film mm. that might have been yeah, and i mean th this may be tasteless in its own way but it might have been a little campier but it's a more appropriate song to use because that was a period 1980 when the band actually adopted the leather look you know because mm. they actually adopted mm. the kind of iconic uh reference mm. to gay culture mm. and mm. the film just misses that whole point it almost feels as though it were deliberate mm. you know? End of discussion. <laughs> Moving into a slightly lighter realm, yeah. um, one of the nicest films, uh, vying with Colette for me this year, mm -hmm. is this beautiful uh, duet between Melissa McCarthy and... Richard E. Grant. Richard E. Grant, mm. who we all love. Um, Can You Ever Forgive Me? Mm. Which initially the title bothered me, but in fact it's a Dorothy Parker quote, so all is revealed within the, the script nice. quickly. Um, marvelous, marvelous. So it's a true story. Now, so does, does the quote come out in any way in the movie? Yes, or it does, okay. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Part of her work. Right. <laughs> so the character in the movie is Lee, Lenora Carroll, who is known as Lee Israel, and she was a writer in the 90s hmm. in Manhattan and did have a degree of success writing biographies and then hits a wall. Her product isn't wanted anymore, no one's buying her books, and uh, she becomes this kind of um, anachronism. She's uh, well known enough to wheedle her way into these literary parties, and um, she's very amusing at these parties. She gets drunk. She's a bitter, twisted woman, for the point we, we discover her, and she has a mouth on her that would stop traffic. Mm. I mean, that's the delightful part of it. That's why it's so wonderful that she's so able to inhabit Dorothy Parker's pen mm. so easily. Anyway, at one point, there's this particular scene where she actually steals a, a coat from one of the uh, parties that she storms out of. <laughs> she picks up somebody else's coat on purpose. Mm. Anyway, she says this chap is being entertained by a lot of fawning women and talking about how 
there's no such thing as writer's block, you know. Mm -hmm. And she says, oh, to be a white man who doesn't even know he's full of crap. And it's such a brilliant line mm -hmm. because it's right at this time where we have other, dare we say, white men that might similarly be described. Mm. You know, it's the political coming climate. Off of, you know, the, the Trumps and the Kavanaugh's of, yep. of this time. So there's a lot of political undercurrent in the dialogue mm -hmm. here. There's a very empowered woman behaving rightfully badly. She's been kind of screwed over by the system. She has great talent as a writer, but there's no place for her anymore. Mm. She just doesn't have a role. So by, she does have a cat though. The cat has a big role, <laughs> you'd like this. Okay. She has a big <laughs> relationship with her cat. Yeah. Um, anyway, she eventually ties up through circumstance with this other bar fly. Richard E. Grant, yes. who plays Brit. an opportunist, right? Oh, well, He's a lovable kind of, how would we describe him? He kind of lives off other people's good graces, mm. but he's so charming, you can see how. Mm -hmm. You know, he's, he's, he's actually got a big heart, but no checkbook, you mm. know, he's one of those. Right. And they team up and they become the most unlikely culprits in this forgery business. Sounds like collusion. It, it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a collusion. Um, Anyway, the thing I was a bit miffed about is if it's true, she does get off awfully lightly mm. because this is a pretty big offence. Yeah. Theft of proper artefacts and also then um, taking on several personas and making vast sums of money for forging the letters. Um, but anyway, she also is a very likeable character yeah. <clears throat> and terribly entertaining on screen. And she's very stripped down, you know, she's... Uh, uh, the Is it a no makeup role? No makeup, mm -hmm. the old Mac, yeah. uh, cat hairs, yeah. dreadful things under the bed Richard E. Grant discovers, from, you know, left by the cat. Uh, well, me, I mean, uh, kind of a question about her performance specifically. I mean, is she in any way kind of riffing off her reputation of kind of this, you know, because her kind of comedic persona has been, we're a little bit oversaturated with it at this point, and it's, it's had some diminishing returns. Does she kind of play any kind of twist on that? Is she, because that's, that's a big part, I think, of the selling point of the film. It's like here she is in a light dramatic role, you know, but it's still her at the same time. It seems as though you're alluding to that, that she can, with, you know, a foul language, and that it's still kind of Melissa McCarthy, but now dressed up in a, in a more kind of uh, straight-laced dramatic turn. Well, I can't answer that question because I don't actually know. I have never read enough about Lee Grant. She's now dead mm -hmm. uh, to find out if that's true. Right, but um, I mean, but about Melissa McCarthy's... I don't know. know. Yes, yeah. I don't know if she's just kind of saying, well, you know, here we are. Rather like Lady Gaga becoming Lady Gaga in The Star is Born. Right. You know, uh, do you eventually end up with a bit of yourself in the role? Yeah. I think possibly, yes, yeah, she's known for that. But I think she had the material mm -hmm. within this character. She was known for picking up the phone and imitating Nora Ephron to such a degree, it says at the end of the film, that Nora Ephron wow. said, I'm going to take you to court if you do one more phone impersonation of me. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, so, so she definitely a, had a... And there's a considerable degree of her like, comedic prowess as well in the role, right? It isn't just kind of a straightforward... Well, that's the clever thing about this. Mm -hmm. You know, it's one of those wonderfully, you know, King Lear kind of Cordelia roles where she actually is able to be both lonely and pathetic mm -hmm. and you do actually feel sorry for her although she doesn't want you to feel sorry for mm. her. and and then also she has this amazing wit mm. this acerbic wit and you just love her so there's you know you get she manages to do both of them quite well yeah. the almost interchangeability between like pathos and humor mm. yeah which you know we've always talked about how hard it is to get that balance yeah. just right yeah. but it's convincing and uh, I would say it again, it's, uh, it's beautifully done. Mm -hmm. Of course, Grant is just dynamite. Yeah, can I, can I like, be indulgent yes, and recommend yes, that Americans do. look for Richard E. Grant because he may be a bit of a forgotten name these days? I mean, yeah, he, was, I love him. he was big as a kind of supporting character actor in certain American films here. I mean, maybe most famously The Player, where he played a self-righteous screenwriter. Um, but uh, How to Get Ahead in Advertising mm. with Nolan and I, I mean, he's, he made some of the most phenomenal British films that I know uh, in the 80s, and he's worth looking for. And I think probably, <coughs> just judging from what I've seen previews and things, you know, with the film, it's like it, he's also a big selling point. And I would imagine that after seeing this film, people are going to want to rediscover him. That's he my is. hope, anyway. He's, he's got the screen presence of, like, Bill Nye. Yeah. I mean, they both have this amazing, I said, they're almost unheroic male right. leads, and I love it. You know, they're fumbling 
accidental hits. Yeah. And um, and they're self, you know, deprecating. Yeah. Well, I kind of like this. I kind of like this kind of like you know the pathetic male figure, uh, you know, juxtaposed with her character. It's very strident woman. Yeah, but with yeah. her strident, but also at the same time, the the character that Melissa McCarthy tends to play in these films is like the abject female who doesn't quite recognize how on the fringe she is, and mm. that's you know mm. that kind of pathetic aspect of her characters is what makes it funny. Mm. So it seems as though they're playing with that a little bit, but maybe now with both characters in their own kind of respective gender ways. Before we leave Richard Grant, E. Grant, um, if you go on Netflix, you'll find he does an awful lot of straight British drama for mm. the BBC, not films, great roles. Yeah, something um, we would know nothing of. Which here. you'd know nothing about. So check him out. He's, he's a, a quite amazing actor. Bill Nye is in exactly the same category. He can do cabinet ministers with incredible um, credibility. Mm -hmm. Credible credibility. I don't think that's possible. Yeah, right? sure. Why not? <laughs> it's our show. Authenticity. <laughs> and, um, uh, and then he can also be terribly fey and witty. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, uh, not necessarily keeping with that point, but how else does the film deal with, let's say, other issues we're dealing with nowadays, like the issues of truth and fidelity to truth and, you know, a, a kind of adopting persona. And I mean, there's, it seems like the film is kind of dealing with the relativity of truth, where people like can buy into uh, something that is presented to them as authenticity when it's clearly fraudulent. I mean, does, how does the film deal with it that? It doesn't. It doesn't deal with it. It really doesn't. Okay, that's and, just and a I plot think, ploy. Yeah, kind of. I, and I think that's a very good point you raise there. Mm -hmm. um, is there any kind of ethical dilemma? <clears throat> she she just says she's sorry, mm. but at the same time she says and admits uh, to um, Grant that she has only just received the kind of attention that she's always craved, and it was for her own writing. Mm -hmm. So on some level, she is legitimate. She's faking the letters, but in a very clever style yeah. of the author, because she's knowledgeable enough to know what Ernest Hemingway would have said, right. and enough about his back. She researches their backgrounds. Yeah. So she actually does know a great deal about the characters. She's writing in their style, mm -hmm. to the point where these, uh, these go for thousands of of dollars, these letters. Okay. So it's really more about, it's almost like a kind of analysis of the nature of authorship. What is authorship? Yes, what's yeah. authorship? That's, yes, mm -hmm. that, I think it looks at that more. Interesting. Um, and how real is real. I think you raise a good point, that, because, you know, then we go back to how much of Freddie Mercury's life was invented or left out mm -hmm. for the sake of the film. Right. You know, yeah. Yeah, well, that's not something we want to talk about. Well, that's, you know. that's a dangerous area to get into, you know, <laughs> uh, this kind of like the, the biography of the dead celebrity. It's like, you know, who is the one who's going to steer the ship of the legacy? You know, and again, that's uh, it's just a, a deeply mm. troubling issue with a film like that. Mm. As I say, you know, just to kind of finish off on something kind of general but a lighter note, you know, I was really reluctant to, to when I saw the previews for Rocket Man versus Bohemian Rhapsody because just as we were saying, the trailers for Bohemian made it really look like they were going out of their way to capture the essence of this character, which I feel the film failed miserably in case I didn't get that point across. Whereas <laughs> Rocket Man, I'm now looking forward to it. And I was kind of dreading that because the whoever's playing Elton John, it, they didn't seem to be going for the accuracy. The voice isn't really, it doesn't, it's not perceived mm, as being accurate. Mm. And yet the film is portraying itself in the advertising as, you know, based on a real life fantasy, right? I like that. I like a film that kind of is kind of just honest about itself, that here we are, we're going to kind of flirt with the history, but we're going to take considerable artistic License. liberties. Yes, yeah. yeah. So, well, um, we've covered all the bases, I think. So um, enjoy films uh, with a pinch of salt. Mm. Um, and uh, we're not going to make any turkey jokes, are we, Michael? No, heaven forbid. But I did see a great tea towel last week that said, I'm all ready for Thanksgiving. I'm stuffing the turkey with Valium. Nice. Which I thought it was quite funny. Yeah. Whatever gets you through. Caustic. No, story. seriously, that's my golden rule. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, it's goodbye for now from me. And from me as well, Michael Dow. Mary Stack. Take care. <laughs>